Good morning. Hey everybody, welcome to your Friday um, lecture series in art and art history. Um, I'm Heather Freeman. I'm going to be the MC for y'all today. Um, some very quick housekeeping before we launch into uh, a presentation by our visiting artist today, uh, Atia Newman. Um, so uh, first, let me see if I can do this. Share my screen. This will be the moment of truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, uh, Atia will be back again on April 9th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. So go ahead and do a quick screen grab of that bit.ly uh, code um, and there'll be more information coming out soon. But we're going to be having a, a panel on diversity in gaming as part of the launch of Atkins Library's new diversity in gaming collection. Um, and we're really excited about this. Um, it's gonna be a bunch of panelists from uh, different aspects of the industry, looking at anti-racism in games, um, accessibility in games, gender in games. So uh, we're really excited about this, this talk and uh, really excited about the new collection. So we hope a lot of you can make it to that. Um, all right, I will stop that sharing. And then next, um, I am going to share with you all um, this is an adapted uh, land acknowledgement for um, Zoom meetings since many of us live in different parts of uh, the country and the world. And so uh, as we gather in this virtual space, we recognize that we are connected with one another through the winds that blow air into our lungs and through the waters that move deep into the earth and up into the sky. We acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples, many of whom have been forced to leave for other lands. We share now the names of the peoples who were here the first to live, celebrate, lament, and sing upon the land where we now sit. Specifically here where I am, the University of North Carolina Charlotte is located on the traditional territories of the Catawba, Waxaw, Chera, and Sugary peoples. And as many of us are settlers, migrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this land, we're here because this land is colonized. May we also remember that indigenous peoples are not a people of the past, but are here with us now. If there are indigenous people in this land, we invite you to share in the chat your tribe so that we may recognize you. And thank you, all of you for being with us today. We hope that you'll accept this invitation to honor, protect and sustain this land through shared knowledge and support for the many indigenous communities who continue to thrive here in our diverse locations around the world today. All right. So Atia Newman is an associate professor in the School of Film and Animation at Rochester Institute of Technology. Most of Atia's work is industry-based animation and game design and projects are created through collaborative teams of specialists to learn, specialists, period. <laughs> <laughs> to learn more about Atia's work, um, I'll type in her uh, website a little bit later on, but she's going to share her work and I wanna maximize that time. So I'll shut up and Atia, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, hi to everyone who is here already, uh, but I can't see you. So I'm just going to assume you're here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right in because I actually I made a really huge PowerPoint thing that I might have to like, cover and answer a lot of questions. Um, I also got a preview of some of the questions that you've already sent in. So I'm going to try and kind of wrap some of that into my presentation as well. Um, and anything I don't cover, please feel free to like come back and ask me as well, because I, I, I forget things. So it's that whole like thing about being a, um, whatchamacallit, absent-minded professor, that's the term. So <clears throat> just to get started, I thought I would um, give you a little bit of an idea of my journey um, and uh, to give you a, a and, and basically I, I thought I would start like basically from the beginning to tell you who I am, where I'm from um, and why I am the way I am. There, there are no good answers for why I am the way I am. I have come to accept that I am strange, but it's fine because you know, being an artist, you're, you're allowed to be a little bit weird anyways. So we'll go from there. Um, things that you should know about me. I was born in Saudi Arabia. I got my first couple of years of education in England. And then I just spent the rest of my like teens and early twenties in Pakistan. Um, I came to the US to study more than anything else and then ended up staying, which was also interesting. And now I've been here for, you can see like a good, good amount of time. So it's like, ooh, how did that happen, right? Um, but I've been, 
around the world. And it like, I think that pretty much puts me because I've been in England as well. I, I think I count like three continents that I've been on. So three, four, three, it's fine. Um, either way, I've been around. So it, it kind of like gave me that concept of having been uh, in so many places, I, I was sort of like very early on connected to, to seeing what the world was from different points of view. Um, things that I did when I was younger, um, almost all of these are before I got my BFA. Um, I, I was sort of like a, one of those kids who just sort of like kept going into things like I would just jump into stuff and you know um, I, I loved painting on walls which you know ended up with me doing a couple of murals um, I actually am in a I think it might still be there in a mural from my old school as well and uh, it, you know I, like my mom would probably be a little bit amused about this if nothing else because you know, they, they spend all of their time trying to make me not uh, paint on walls. And there I was doing it on purpose. So, um, you know, it is what it is, but it was fun. And I, I think that for me, art has always been a process of exploration more than anything else. Um, I never I never went into things thinking that I, I had to like achieve a particular goal. I, I, it was more, I was interested and I would jump in and I would do it. So over here, these are some of the professional projects I've been on. Um, I, I only put like the ones that are actually notable because when you work for like two or three years in a in a production post production house like we did, like there were times when I'd be like on six projects in a week and I just have to like, you know, do my section, um, do my part of it and move on to the next thing. Honestly, if I had to like list the things I'd worked on, I would be able to maybe name like one or two more names and that's it. Um, but that's that's fine because a lot of times when you create work, um, one of the philosophies behind creating work in my part of the world is also that you sort of create it and you let it go. Um, holding on to your past can be detrimental in, in some ways, especially in a creative process because when you're working, your work is always about getting better or, or learning from what you've, uh, taking what you've learned and then moving it forward into something more, um, more powerful, more impactful, more, more everything, you know, whatever it is that your journey is, you're going to find that you keep um, wanting to like, get better at something. And for me, every time I finished a project, I thought, I can do better with this, you know, and then I would like move on to something else. And I'd be like, yes, I, I did that better. But now I found three more things that I want to be better at. And that's actually, I think, why I ended up moving from 2D animation into 3D animation was because I could create movement in 2D. But there was something much more interesting about like building something and then like getting it moving and figuring out the, all the nuts and bolts, sort of like, you know, driving a car versus building a car. Not that I want to build a car, but you get what I'm uh, hopefully so I get what I'm saying. Um, but overall, in the overarching like process of my work, my my central theme that I think is really big for me is creating characters um, or creating like just basically understanding people. Um, these are some uh, things from my sketchbook. If you've seen my website, you've probably found these images there as well. Uh, this is just one of those things that like sort of brought me into the process of like seeing animation and understanding why animation was just so much more impactful. Because in my experience, um, I, my parents, my family, my life was one where we didn't get a lot of time to go to galleries and stuff but I saw animation all the time. I, I was always, it was always accessible in whichever country I was, wherever I was. Um, animation was something that always impinged in my life in some way or the other. Um, when I was a teenager, there was Disney. Before that, there was anime. Uh, there was so many things that, you know, you, you don't think about and you just sort of like see and observe. And then as an adult, I started to like really understand that, animation has a way of creating a world for you and it has a way of telling you things that you may not immediately kind of like absorb or understand right so for example if i were to skip back a second um to here uh if you see commander safeguard um safeguard is a soap um made by png 
And they actually commissioned us to make Commander Safeguard the, you know, Pakistan's first superhero. And the goal of this was to essentially sell soap. But they wrapped it into this message, this, this, you know, overall message of like, you know, hygiene is important. People who don't wash their hands will fall sick. You know, you can spread disease and illness. And how ironic that we're in the land of COVID where everyone tells you to keep washing your hands, right? Um, but this, this was something that we ran in the early 2000s. And part of that is because Pakistan being a, an incredibly poor country, most people are not literate. So they don't understand what germs are or, you know, what, what it is, like how you can fall sick just because you touch something, you know? So getting those things together, like connecting those like little dots, pulling, pulling those threads of information together, and then really like seeing um, writings about things like this, where, where you start to realize that the world we see is very, very greatly governed by what we, by what we consume. And then, and then that normalization of things is what actually creates our thought processes in a way. It's sort of like programming people, right? You know, you're, you're sort of in this weird space where you don't know if you're having a thought or a creative idea because you watched a TV show that made you think of it, or if you're actually having that creative idea. Um, which can get really creepy when you start exploring such things. But for me, you know, it made me go back and kind of question all of the cartoons I ever grew up watching, anything that I enjoyed, um, even things that I watch right now. And it made me think, hmm, should we be looking at this and actually dissecting it? What, what do we create? And what do we just take for granted? You know, like it's so easy to look at superheroes and think, sure, every woman should look like that in leotard, you know, or every man should look like that in a skin tight suit, even if they have to wear padding or like, you know, whatever, like our brains don't process the details. We don't, if we don't like um, deconstruct the nitty gritty of what the image is in front of us, then, then we take it at face value and then we internalize that. This is where all of those concepts of body image and stuff come in as well. And then, of course, there is the question of separation, right? Like where, for, for me, because I, I was born in Saudi Arabia, we lived there for a few years, and because I grew up in Pakistan, I was always disappointed at how, how I was represented. Because being a Muslim, being a brown person, being from Pakistan, which has been declared a terrorist state a few times, I believe, um, it, it's sort of like makes you think well I didn't do anything like it's not my fault if if you know another government doesn't like us they've they've never even met us you know like how many people go to Pakistan and check it out and say well clearly you're you guys are terrorists because we hate the way you live um 90 percent of the time it's something that some nameless faceless person did and then it bounces back but that's where the concept of representation comes in. And that's where the concept of even appropriation comes in. Because when we do start to see how other cultures are represented in, in media, and I don't just mean like American media or European media, I mean, media in general, even Pakistanis are, you know, we put ourselves in that mold now, you know? Um, but so much of it, then the question becomes how much of it is, is given to us by by what we see and what we watch and how much of it is just because we are that way you know it, it's it becomes hard to separate truth from from reality and when i look at things like disney's um aladdin and stuff like you're going to notice that they they take appropriation to a new art <laughs> in some ways you know like um or maybe they created it i don't know um but Disney has this way of like sort of simplifying things and homogenizing stuff and then repackaging other cultures in in a manner that they I think that they feel will be most consumable. Right. Because Disney speaks to the entire world. They they speak to the children from all countries. And in doing so, they they need to they try to take away things that are uncomfortable that could be perceived as uncomfortable they try to kind of like play up you know exotic and cute things even if those aren't real and and that exotic cuteness 
um, can somehow sometimes be ultimately harmful. So, you know, it, it, it just, it's a weird, weird scenario. And then it makes, which makes me then think about how, um, what responsibility we have as artists. Um, because if I got to work with Disney, I would love it. I, you know, I mean, sign me up, right? Like everyone wants to work with Disney. Everyone wants to work with Pixar. But then I think about it and I think about like how I would feel if I were part of something that would ultimately hurt another culture or another race. Because at the end of the day, you can be really good at what you do, but if you are doing something, if you have power, if your, if your medium has power, then it comes with responsibility, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And um, the question for every artist and every animator in that sense is that representation is not always good. Appropriation is a real thing. And the idea of like how representation falls into a, a appropriation is when, when you start taking somebody's image and just reusing it in a way that suits you more than them. And this is, this is a, a disturbing thing in that sense, right? Because colonialism, if you've ever studied about colonialism, colonialism is a little bit like that. It's about um, not just the physical um, imposition of a space. It's about what you, what you tell the people that you control. There are a lot of words for it and there are a lot of discussions about this. Um, I, I don't think I'm an authority necessarily, but having grown up in a post-colonial society, I can see and I have experienced that concept, that confusion that comes with um, being raised reading history books that call your freedom fighting as a mutiny. Um, which, uh, you, you know, I mean, in America, like all of, all of our history books here are, are about like here, this is the war of independence. But if, if the British got to write your history books, can you imagine, I, I can't imagine them actually calling it the American war of independence. I would call it the American like, you know, resurgence or insurgence or mutiny or something like that, where they'd be like these damn colonials, they turned around and they tried to get their own country, you know? Um, which, which of course changes the narrative, right? It's, it's the two, two sides of that same coin. It's a truth, but it's truth from two different sides of the story. And that's why representation and appropriation is very, very like important and also, you know, dangerous. So my theme or my theory in general is that accurate representation is where everything should, should begin. Because if you must, and you must include everyone in the world, if there is a recognition of, of cultures and races and people besides the norm, and I say that very, you know, afraid of things, um, then, then the way the other cultures and races are presented must be presented with a sense of, with a degree of sensitivity that would otherwise be missing, right? Like what we see right now, like, um, I'm so uh, glad uh, Heather read the um, little thing in the beginning about Native American culture, because this is one of the things that was really important to me, uh, that became very like, that really sat with me, that resonated with me, um, was that when we, when I grew up looking at cartoons, I, I you know, saw cartoons from everywhere, it never occurred to me that Native American culture was anything more than fringes and feathers. You know, I didn't know that there was more than one type of tribe. I thought Mohawks were it. You know, I think that was the most common um, thing that I'd learned about. And then I saw Pocahontas and Pocahontas was, well, Pocahontas, right? She, she was beautiful. There was music. There was, you know, cute characters running around, you know, trying to save the, the world and then not. Um, but this was this was one of those like things where I was pulled into it because I didn't know about the culture and I was young and learning essentially. But understanding that like Pocahontas was um, was damaging for for Native American cultures was something that came when I started working on the Iroquois creation story because all of a sudden I was able to relate like having you know seen how Aladdin was was presented in 
how Aladdin was used to present like Arab culture, you know. Um, I remember being really upset even as a kid and thinking, that's not what what Arabs do. I, I live there. Like this is not what we what we live with. Like um, the world is different. Women don't walk around half naked, and you know things are not miserable and oppressive. But um, and in the same way, then I was able to like look at Pocahontas and I started to understand like, oh my God, like there are so many things that we just don't know. And with the Iroquois, this became even more uh, interesting for me because I had to then build characters and we had to figure out how to tell their story. So the Iroquois creation story as a whole, um, it was um, semi-commissioned. We uh, there was a, we won a grant um, we through the Ganondagon Farish Foundation, and um, half of that uh, half of the funds sort of went towards making the film that we created, and the other half went towards creating um, a new type of uh, choreographed dance for for the Iroquois themselves. Um, but the goal that they brought to us that they asked us to do was to make a film that would encode their religious and cultural beliefs. The creation story is their story of how the world was made. And um, yes, it was made by uh, being on a turtle. Um, but I mean, you know, again, the, the, then the question becomes like, while you're, you're presenting, while you're learning how to build this other culture, um, you have to figure out how to let go of your own your own ideas and your own preconceptions. And for me, again, a foreign, don't understand a lot of things. I was sort of like, wow, I had very weird ideas about Native Americans. So for us, one of the things that we really had to do was figure out how not to be insulting. And, and that's work, <laughs> in case you hadn't realized. Um, uh, it, it's it's not as easy as just looking at uh, looking at stuff. We we had people from all around the world, um, you know, our own animation team, myself included. Uh, we had you know uh, people uh, Latinas. We had of course white students as well. But there was there was a good mix of people who were working on this. But there weren't any kind uh, any native uh, uh, students or faculty members who we could talk to. And um, it sort of created that problem in our lives where we were like, where do we go for this? So we, we went to two very direct sources that, that exist in our region over here. Um, the upstate New York region is home to the Seneca tribes, um, the Iroquois tribes. I think there are nine tribes with, within them. Um, I knew this more when we were actually producing this, uh, but this uh, we were able to, uh, work with G. Peter Jamison, who we was, he was listed as our executive producer because he sort of became our um, guru of gurus at this point. He, he has a, a huge history, he's an activist. He currently manages the site, um, the Seneca Cultural Center. Um, and he, he is an artist himself and he creates a lot of art that is representative of his culture itself. So having somebody who was essentially a philosophical leader of his people as, as the source of like authenticity for us made life a lot, lot easier. But we had like a bunch of like challenges that came into the process of this. For starters, the whole, the original story is very long. It's, it's an oral story as well. So um, the, there are a lot of different versions of it as well. From tribe to tribe, uh, the story kind of differs just a little bit and figuring out like how to pick something that would be, be similar across all the tribes and not offensive to any of them um, took a little bit of work, uh, especially in the script writing process. And, and then from an animation production point of view, it was, interesting because we had to figure out how to restrict our characters and how to figure out how to make this. The original um, film was, their original like idea was to have us make this film in, in live, a live action, like no animation, get cameras, do CG, figure it out. Um, but anybody who knows anything about um, CG will, will know that it's really hard to meld and um, bridge the gap between live characters and then put in like 
you know, your your CG characters that can that are half man, half bird, or any number of things. So we had to get very creative. We did, I think. Um, and we used every medium we possibly could. A anything that would make it work, we we did it. And we started first by reducing the number of characters that we needed to have that would who would act and speak. And then we we started to like put things together into sections and phases. Um, but as we did, of course, the visual design was super important. So we 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 did the the old boring route. We did a lot of research. We found um, Iroquois people, actual Native Americans who live on a nearby reservation, and we got references. We got references for everyone. This ended up being our entire cast, um, and I have not included pictures of the the, the baby and. Um, I think I have a picture maybe of the teens, but we got reference footage for, for every single like person who had a face um, as opposed to the turtle man who was designed specifically with a lot of consultation again. But we, we got together all sorts of like material. We put together a lot of like work. You can see most of the drawings over here, the artwork over here is actually um, G. Peter Jemison's um, because once he he agreed to be our sort of like art mentor, he he went on this building spree, and it was it was amazing because we were able to actually like look through this and and you know um, infer details from the process of of uh, his creation where where we could like go off off of reality, right? Like because when you're creating something that is as fantastical as a creation story. Um, realism in many ways just doesn't have a place in that. Um, not to not to say that it's unrealistic, but there's something amazing about having a, a sunflower that is so big that it can cast light over the entire world, right? Um, there's something amazing about the the concept of like a person land falling for for many many eons or um, a long time to land on a turtle and then build the earth out of a turtle. Those concepts were, were so sort of rich in their own selves that it became very important for us to, to hold on to that richness, but also to bring in um, an element of realism as well. So these over here, um, we started like taking actual pictures and we, we started figuring out how to design our characters and how to, how to stylize them and how to put in information that's, that's necessary for, for any um, Iroquois person, at least, to look at this film and see themselves in it. Because in the same way that I, I wanted to see myself in a story like Aladdin, um, I think every, every Native American wanted to see something of themselves in Pocahontas. And so if, you know, in the absence of that, I felt it was our responsibility to create something where where they could relate to themselves. And the importance of building things like these and understanding like um, how, you know, what their dress was, the patterns that they would use in their, uh, on their, on themselves and in their tattoos or um, in their hair. These were all super, super important to, to bring in, but also to incorporate in a uh, in a less willy-nilly fashion, you know, like you don't want to be someone who is going to just grab something from anywhere and not really care about where where it came from just because it looks right. Um, we're not the judges of of what looks right, you know. So for us, it was very much like, yeah, we have to we have to figure this out and we have to do it by working with the people who really are the people. So these are some of our like human references uh, that we had. Um, you can see over here on the uh, on the top left corner, this costume is actually almost exactly what we got here. Well, not exactly. Um, we had to simplify it a little bit. What, but we bought in those elements, those you know that concept of like beadwork, the concept of you know their hairstyles, anything that we could. Um, we kind of like sorted through, and we 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 went into it. Um, I can play this as well, but it's a pretty long film. So I'm going to maybe show like the first two or three minutes just to get an idea of what it is. And then I can um, 
kind of share the link with you guys so that you can see it at another point. Um, I cannot give you a location right now for where you can see it publicly because this film is going to be, um, from my understanding, where where the Ganondagon Foundation wants to put it up on iTunes, um, but they're trying to figure out how or something. So um, I don't want to be in charge of distribution for it, but I will, of course, I am allowed to share it over here and with you guys um, as educational places. So uh, let me, I have a feeling that I'm not gonna be sharing sound right now. Sorry. Can anybody hear sound? of Skyworld, hidden from the villagers, Elder Man raised his niece and nephew in isolation so they would possess goodness of mind. Mature Blossom, remember, you will face many tests and challenges along your journey. Be brave, do not falter. Yahweh, Uncle, thank you. Go now, little sister. We will see each other again. Someday, I will come to where you are. Yeah. Goodbye, elder brother. Mature Blossom's destiny was to become the wife of Hagachi, the guardian of the celestial tree. The great tree provided light and food for the sky world beings. You, Eskeno, you have arrived safely. I have thrust all things from this place through the ground, so that all can be renewed. Look, the great tree grows dimmer as we speak. Mature Blossom and the guardian of the tree lived together for some time. One night, Hagaji had a dream. He wanted all the people to guess his dream, so that the vision of his soul would become real. Many tried to guess, but none got it right. Finally. Comet stepped forward. In your dream, did we uproot the celestial tree and create a great hole? Is that your vision and your wish? Yes. The flowers have withered, and all that exists can become new again. I saw my wife and I sitting on the edge of the hole, sharing food. Have all of the conditions of your dream been fulfilled? Yes. And now you must depart from here. Comet guided her on her long journey when he saw the water below the floor. and the water beings all wanted to help the woman falling from the sky. They called her Sky Woman. The Arctic loon caught her on his wings and brought her gently down towards the vast dark ocean. The great turtle volunteered to carry her on his shell. surface. 
but in his paw was clenched some dirt, and they pushed that dirt up on the back of the great turtle. The first thing Sky Woman did was to perform a dance of gratitude. As she danced, she pushed the earth out with her feet in a counterclockwise direction. Round and round she danced. And as she danced, the back of the turtle got bigger and bigger. This dance is still performed today. Sorry. So I'm going to move on from here because it's a 16 minute thing and I don't want to use up the entire time. Um, but from here, well, let me try and move forward. So the creation of this film, the Iroquois creation story, um, ended up teaching me a lot. Uh, I think hopefully it taught a lot uh, to our, our students and our faculty who worked with us as well. Um, but but for me personally, it really made me understand that like the, the problem of, of representation slash appropriation is real for, for all cultures in many ways. We, we all are in a habit of um, absorbing things that we see and using them without thinking about it. Um, and for me personally, like I started to understand that if there is going to be uh, representation of any uh, of any nation or any culture, it has to work with with collaboration, and it has to actually have people who who can answer questions about their about their culture and their race, and ideally with like some degree of um, some kind of a, a an under like a bigger overview of things rather than the gut um, one person one person's experience. Um, that would otherwise sometimes be created. It's, it's really important to remember that Googling is really not the way to go. Um, I've, I've tried many times actually to like look up certain things about tribes or about countries or about anything. And, and it, all it does is make me aware of the fact that there is, there is no uh, answer on the internet. Like um, in case you hadn't already understood this or if nobody else had mentioned this, it's true, the internet will lie to you. And, and if you must find out the truth about any culture, the first thing, the best way to, to figure it out is actually to go to there, go there, like immerse yourself in it, visit those places, see the world and see it for yourself. But being told by people who, who claim to be um, the authority is, is, is tricky because it's, it leaves room to be um, fooled. And, and then you can end up accidentally using your art in a way that doesn't really like give you the, the satisfaction that it should. So from there, what happened immediately after the Iroquois film, um, I ended up working with a co uh, my, one of my coworkers to, to actually start creating this, um, the character mosaic project. The goal of this was to, taking what I'd learned about the Iroquois uh, especially, was to start really figuring out how to create um, real characters and real, not real as in real people, but real characters who, who represent different cultures. Um, and of course, there's, there's always the fear of falling into stereotyping, but, but building a, a character is, is a lot of work and building like something that is um, more accurate is essentially much more painful. So um, I didn't uh, know if everyone here would know it enough about building um, what it takes to build a CG character. So I thought I would actually like answer this question in advance. Um, but in terms of like making characters for animation, uh, it takes, uh, there are a lot of steps that are kind of involved in it. You have to like sort of build the actual shape of the character, then you have to like put skin on it and you have to like put bones in it and you have to put controls to make the bones work a certain way. 
And, and this process, especially the putting in of the bones and stuff, the rigging process, that's one of the most um, difficult to get right. And the problem is, is if you do it wrong, then everything else comes out bad. Like everything looks bad because your character just doesn't move correctly. So you can't animate it. Sort of like building a real life puppet and then attaching the strings in the wrong places, right? You don't get the, the, get the movement that will allow you to create an illusion of, of reality, an illusion of a, of a relatable character. And that makes life very, very, um, very, very difficult just overall. So what we figured was that if we are gonna build, uh, what we figured is through the process of this project, what we could do is take away that pain, essentially. We could, we could address the issues that come from making a character and having it explode a little bit like this um, uh, and kind of like sidestep that entire process and end up making something where if anybody wants to tell a story uh, about any one of their cultures, they can essentially come to us and they can, they can use our characters and put them into the story that they're looking for and make it work the way they want. Um, the idea, of course, then is to enable other artists, uh, other artists and other storytellers to tell stories about their lives. So in the process of this, one of the things that I really wanted to like emphasize was the fact that we ourselves didn't set ourselves up as the, the storytellers of process because um, uh, the storytellers of the different cultures. We, we wanted to just create the process or ease the process of building things so that if anybody else wanted to do it, they weren't hampered by their own technical skill. So we started this in 2017. Uh, this was about a year and a half after the Iroquois film. Um, the Iroquois film ended up winning a lot of awards, it, you know, got a lot of like accolades. We were very, very proud of it, but I needed to like figure out how to, how to bring this together. So we'd been talking for a while and we realized that we could either try to make the characters ourselves, which let me tell you, not easy, hard to design things like this as well, or we could actually like tap into the, the, the greater hive mind that is um, any academic situation where you have students, you have artists, you have people who think. Um, so we asked our students to submit designs and it wasn't just our students, this was open uh, university wide. And um, we got them to figure out how to represent one or one of seven ethnic categories. I think it was um, Asian, African, African-American, um, I want to say Middle Eastern, uh, and then there was wild card, can't remember all of them, it's fine. Um, but anyways, we ended up with these, and these were after, like, you know, we, we got a pretty decent um, number uh, of uh, submissions and stuff. Uh, but then we gathered together a whole bunch of jurors, uh, people, including Peter, Peter Jamison, um, and uh, got them to just talk about like what they thought was authenticity in characters. And we, we had to discuss like the concept of st uh, stylization and whether something would be insulting just because, because it might be like kind of narrowing down or flattening something up, or if it was okay to, to borrow like a, a generic sort of generic feature from, from some culture to put onto a character. And ultimately, because this was our first time around uh, putting this uh, putting this competition together and during this uh, competition, we we came up with this as a sort of like our initial um, representation of the characters. From here, um, we started working with them, and we started getting. We hired uh, a few students. Uh, we made a small team, and we started building uh, all of these things. Uh, started building the character process itself. Uh, we were lucky, we got some seed funding as well, and we started creating our first characters. Um, I don't have the characters here primarily because I, I don't want to kind of give away all of the details here when, when the talk uh, on April 9th is coming up as well, and I feel like it might become too uh, repetitive. Um, so instead, what I'll also do is talk about the, the current project that I'm working on that kind of pulled me, that also, again, came actually directly out of the character mosaic project as well. <clears throat> that too is sort of um, an in-process thing. Um, but 
<clears throat> we definitely have, uh, oh, just as a quick reminder, the character mosaic project, we're, we're in the process where we're able to like put our characters out soon. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And again, I will cover more about this as we go. But my current project um, was created primarily to give, uh, primarily because once I started enabling other characters to other people, essentially like in my brain with character mosaic project, I started thinking about how much I wanted to do something for my own culture as well. Um, because Pakistan is sort of the, the you know, everyone knows us and everyone doesn't know us kind of country, you know, where, where you know, some things, none of them are good. And yet there's, there's so much that is still to offer. But one of the things that made a big difference for me was, was this quote where, and I love, uh, this is a great quote as well. It's like that concept of like misrepresentation and um, uh, identity in general is the fact that like, I realized through this entire process that it's very important for people of any culture to start taking an active control, uh, active um, role in the telling of their own stories. Because as long as we, we wait for anybody else to come up or anybody else to recognize um, us and our, our beauty in our unique ways, um, <clears throat> the, the longer it'll take for, for us to be recognized and the longer it'll, the more it'll just get to hurt us. So what I ended up doing was <clears throat> I, I used this project because I actually researched this particular fort a very long, long time ago. And I decided that this over here, um, and you can see this is an aerial view because the fort itself is about the size of a small city. Um, but this this fort is amazing. It's built with it was built in the uh, I want to say the 11th century, um, but it was really revived when when our Islamic rulers, the one this Islamic dynasty, came into the subcontinent, and they started sort of establishing what we know as like as subcontinental culture nowadays. Um, they they were huge patrons of the arts. They were huge. Um, they loved music, they loved gardens, they loved a lot of things. But the only things that we know about them, even as Pakistanis today, most of most your average person only knows that they were military leaders, they did a lot, they built a lot, and now everyone thinks that they're druggies as well, which is kind of disturbing. And um, I know because I've done research on this, it's not true. So for me, what I decided was I would use my skills, what, even though the character mosaic project is going on, um, I wanted to do this as a passion project where I'm going to make this in VR and create this as something that would end up, oh, it's just one of our characters. Um, but I wanted to create this as something that would actually combat that negative, um, narrative that's being created and has been created against around um, Islamic culture, around Pakistan, around anything that's from that part of the scary world, I guess. And I wanted to just kind of bring up those things. I wanted to show the world and share with the world um, the beauty that exists that is in many ways unreachable for, for the greater part of the population. So my goal is to build this fort in VR and make it so that people can, can look around and keep, they can walk around and they can uh, basically roam through it like you would through a video game essentially where you can, you know, instead of like fighting hordes of demons or, you know, um, I don't know what Assassin's Creed does, but, you know, instead of like having armies to fight and things like that, like in, maybe you could just walk around in a place like this and look at the art and the, the details and see, um, see everything that, that was created, that, that we feel that when we walk through these spaces and understand what these spaces were built for and what they um, feel like to be around. Also, of course, just the sheer intricacy of something that was created 600 years ago is, is pretty epic and, and worth sharing. So 
on that note, um, I'm going to wrap up my talk and actually move into the Q&A thing. Um, I'm not sure if I answered all of the questions, but I'm gonna just actually pop out of screen sharing and come to the question and answer section. Um, should we, uh, do, will anybody be, would you like to suggest which questions I should answer? Sorry, hey. I'm not very used to like not having feedback. <laughs> I know it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a new weird, feeling. It's yeah. a weird format, but thank you so much. That was like, that was so interesting. And really, I, I just want to say first, like, thank you so much for sharing that. Cause I think, um, you know, for uh, a lot of, especially undergraduate students thinking about um, narrative animation, um, but also game design. And, and again, that's something probably that will come up uh, on the April talk. Yeah. Um, you know, there is always this sort of sense of like, oh, I don't have any stories. Like, I don't have any stories to tell. And, and it's like, no, yes, you do. You know, so everyone that's, has a story. Yeah. Everybody has a story, you know, and, um, and sometimes it's, it's, it just takes time and working on other people's stories to like realize, you know, that your own is worth telling too. Or sometimes you could just jump to your own story and tell that story. So it's true. Yeah. yeah. I, I spend a long time trying not to tell any of my stories. Like I, you know, for me, it, that's actually why I didn't go into fine art. Like I was like, I can't be one of those people who talks about myself, like, you know, and not to like flatten, like, uh, you know, at all, like, you know, make it sound like it's a terrible thing, but you know, uh, all of my fine artists, uh, fine art professors, um, this is in my first year of undergrad, like everyone was like, you know, Atia, you should just be a painter. It's fine. Like you can do this. And I was like, yes, but then I'll have to talk about my feelings and nobody <laughs> likes talking about their feelings, you know? <laughs> so, so it was very much like, I'm not doing it. I'm going to go straight into graphic design. I'll make stuff. People will pay me. It'll be really cool, you know? <laughs> and, and then next thing you know, uh, there was like, no matter how much I ran from it, I realized like every time you create a piece of art, it is a part of you, you know, like you can't help it. Like it's, it's just, even if you're paid to do it for someone else, like I said, with the Iroquois film, like right. I'm not Iroquois. I have, I, you know, I don't live that culture or anything of the sort, but while I was making it, it was like pieces of me were like being pulled into it. Like I was relating to it more and more as I built it because it was just, it's so real, you know, like once you start to realize the the human elements, the the things that like make us, you know, because we're created by environment, by by you know, our genes, by by circumstance, you know, um, the the period of history that we're born in, all of these things, they affect us so much. And then if you if you're able to like step across into somebody else's like period of history and genealogy and everything then it, it then they you suddenly realize like everyone experiences the same things yes. you know yeah totally i think it's um you know i think the sort of um there's this really artificial split between the digital arts and graphic design and the fine arts and it's like i think we get obsessed with that when it's mm -hmm. kind of an artificial binary right like it it's is. all visual culture and it's all it a is. function of both the individual and that individual's cultural experience, you know, their habitus, Absolutely. if you want to go there. Um, yeah. And I think it's like, um, there's also this idea that um, art, you know, with the big A art is, is somehow inherently good and somehow inherently <laughs> like noble and ethical. Better. And like, it's not like, you know, you yeah. look at somebody like Lenny Riefenstahl's films, right? You know, it gets <laughs> ugly real fast. So I think like these, these ethical questions about the responsibility of the artist, be they an artist, a graphic designer, a filmmaker, a game designer, um, their responsibility to the people who will experience their work, their work, yeah. but also the people who indirectly experience the effects of their work. Um, yeah. It's just, it's just such an important thing to like frame and it's, but it's hard to talk about and it's hard to know how to, and I think, yeah. I think your emphasis on research was so key to that. Like it really does Very. come down to research. It does, because I mean, at the end of the day, like if we if we go over like really, really shallow in what we do, then then we are definitely we're, we're bound to create 
or propagate the same mistakes and the same same injustices in that sense you know like things that we that we currently like I was actually having this conversation with my students yesterday is like this focus currently on in media about nostalgia like we're all like oh the 80s like who doesn't love art from the 80s who doesn't love and it's like I'm sorry like I yeah right you know it's really cool and cute and stuff was very lovey-dovey but let's not forget like the Berlin Wall was still up there was still the Cold War everyone was still like half dying bunches of people were being like traumatized all over the world like no different from today the only reason why there's nostalgia about it is that the people who are currently making films are thinking huh I wish I could go back to those old days and we're propagating this mindset and it's and it's dangerous because we're we're forcing a backward thinking idea instead of something that says look there's something beautiful about right now and you can make something beautiful tomorrow you know like if you don't find ways to to elevate what is around you and to really make people see what's wrong with now then then we're never going to fix it like if we if we keep hiding in the past then we're never going to go anywhere you know um it's a it's a really like it, it's such a it's a big big conversation it's a big topic you know but it, it's definitely it's something that's very paramount in my mind nowadays just because I'm trying to like unravel all of these things about how history is written oh gosh like we can go there. <laughs> I, I did want to jump to I, uh, a couple student questions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and there was one in chat. And, and um, so, I mean, maybe this gets a little bit to also like, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know if you have this problem, like you um, like get obsessed about like 10,000 different possible project ideas and then actually <laughs> focusing on one, especially because um, anybody who works in animation knows how freaking and crazy long and slow that process just inherently is. Yeah. Um, but with that in mind, um, Amber asks, um, I know that in my hometown, our band of the EBC has put a great emphasis on language learning and fostering native speakers. Have mm -hmm. you thought about working to do animations or stories like this in native tongues? Actually, no, I haven't. Um, I, I think this is, this would be a great, um, great thing to like kind of go for. Uh, we had a lot of trouble actually casting for the Iroquois because um, we we got native uh, speakers who, and the goal was people who couldn't speak English so that their their accents wouldn't be kind of like messed with the, the Englishifying of an accent, um, which is a thing, even if I use a funny word for it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but the problem was of course, A, we had to get them to like, speak in English and they had to like, it was a whole sort of thing. But the worst was, was our sound engineers were, were annoyed because they were like, well, they speak in a monotone and we need them to act. And it was hard because I mean, like voice acting is hard. Like you have to be sort of more animated and uh, so much of like, there's so much that you have to kind of put into it. So they kept pushing us to go for like professional uh, native uh, speakers. And, and we, we, we bit the bullet. We were like, you know what, even if the quality or if the speech is too flat for you, like we're going to go with it because people will get used to that. You know, like the only reason why it feels flat to us is because we're used to like over animated and over exaggerated speech. And honestly, like this is stuff that people can learn. So, so I, I really think like it would be wonderful, uh, like for people to like, foster native talent um, and talent like for for a lot of things I don't know about like learning other languages like from what I understand uh, Native American uh, languages can be very um, precise to their own things so I don't know if I would um... <laughs> uh, sorry I saw that like yeah I just I, 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 <laughs> to be fair we weren't saying that it was an Americanized accent um, it, I think the the question the part of this was from feedback from uh, Peter Jemison as well. Um, he didn't want um, people who had grown up speaking English, but people who had understood English like as a second language, because according to them, there's a real accent and then there's sort of the bastardized, you went to a, a you know, a, an American school kind of accent, which, you know, I, like we weren't really in a position to like argue with them because hey it's their culture right so this was one of those things where it was sort of like okay you know I think that if this is important to the people who are being represented 
then it's okay to subvert like our quote quality ideas mm -hmm. and really just bring up the stuff that they they want to hear you know because right now the film is in permanent display at the Seneca Cultural uh, Cultural Center and they use it for for their children to to actually watch and hear and I think for them it was just really important to do it in the voices of their elders yeah. so we went from there we worked off of that for sure Tweet. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch yeah. gears just because um, I know there's some um, students in the audience who are interested in going into careers in animation. Mm -hmm. um, and wait, where they say um, what? Okay, this is from B Jones, Bex Jones. Uh, I love your blog addressing cultural appropriation and artist work. That, that's one one point she just wanted to say. Yeah. Um, uh, what's the number one advice you would give to students when wanting to incorporate characters? Oh wait, oh sorry. Bex, I apologize. Oh. I thought I, I'm going to actually ask a different question because I thought this was like, um, OK, because because you did talk about that. I'm sorry. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm failing at being MC. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there was a really good. Oh, OK, right. Um, right. So I'm going to combine a couple questions. So um, uh, Sam and Natalie and Emmett uh, ask a series of questions about for students just getting started out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to just throw these at you and then you can just answer them okay. how you want. That's fun. Um, so one is um, from Emmett, when it comes to jobs, do employers lean towards certain schools uh, like traditional art schools versus a non-traditional uh, or like a, a public university type of education? Um, so like, is it all about your portfolio or is it all, you know, does your school you go to impact that? Um, and that leads to Natalie's question, which is like, well, how do you even find jobs in animation out of college? And then that leads to Sam's question, which is like, well, or just what's the advice that you'd give them? Or like, what's <laughs> one thing you wish you knew? Okay, so yeah, that's a, that's a uh, it's a good thing you lump them together as well because they do bleed into each other for yeah. sure. Um, so I'm going to say the school matters maybe a little in the sense that like there are a few schools that are sort of like feeder schools for like your big like uh, Disney Pixar type places. Um, Ringling has that. Uh, I think they might actually have a contract with them. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, USC, uh, um, UCLA, sorry, is is very like, you know, big with that. But U UCLA is like that because most of their alum are the ones who kind of created um, some of the original uh, stuff that we work with today, right? So, so those are sort of like legacy type schools and you can't get away from that. And honestly, we work with that, we have that same issue. But at the end of the day, um, if your portfolio is good, nobody cares. They don't care if you came from Timbuktu, if you draw like an angel. Um, and if you, it's true, like they, they, they look at the end of the day, like the, the most, the best merit is, is your talent. Um, and how you represent the talent as well. So um, that's gonna be, uh, that leads into the whole process of getting attention. So students have it rough, especially nowadays, I'm not lie. students have it rough. Um, the animation industry, as big as it is in many ways, is like this small in reality, like everyone knows each other and everyone is sort of like, we're still nerds, you know, like we don't have social skills. Like if, if you were, <laughs> you know, we don't know how to make friends with people. We don't know what to do. And we're all we, like, I'm betting like 90% of the an world of animation has been bullied when they were in school. So they're afraid all the time. Um, but the good thing is, is that makes them really, really easy to approach because they don't have that ego. I mean, you'll find like the occasional ego person who will just be like, I'm the god of everything. Um, but for the most part, your actual like animators, the people who know what they're doing, the people who make it, uh, who actually build work are, are non-egotistical, which, which means that the best thing to do actually is to find them. You know, I, I tell my students all the time, I'm like, go stalk them on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on whatever, like start finding the companies that you're really interested in and then strike up a conversation. Don't do the thing of like, hey, I think you're really cool. Can you get me a job? Um, do the, you know, hey, you play this video game. So do I. I need advice. Can you give me some advice? You know, um, because and this is something that I probably should have mentioned really early on. And it might answer one or two of the other questions, which is um, art and animation or any kind of career in something like this 
is, is one of those things where you have to prepare yourself to always be learning. You will never be at the top of your game or the top of any game. There's no such thing as being at the top of this game, especially in the land of technology. Things change all the time. So the minute you let go of that thing of like, I must be perfect before I apply for something or I must be perfect before I am good enough to talk to X, Y, Z person, um, the better. Like, seriously, you just you want to get rid of that whole concept and just reach out and be like, this is me. I am here. I really want to learn. And the more more humility you can reach out with, the more um, friendliness you you can convey in your process and and not fake friendliness. People do have an instinct to pick that out. Um, the better, you know, you're, you're going to find ways to connect with people and connecting them with them on a human level with with their interests is is an excellent uh, thing to do, because immediately it means that a they they sort of like take you under their wing, you know, they'll be like, hey, you know, I, I gave you this feedback. Okay, good. Like, oh, I've got this, you know, like you should do this more and this more and this more. And um, sometimes if you catch the really good artists, they'll they'll give you some really brutal feedback as well. They were, they'll rip your work apart. Um, that's a good thing. You know, it means they cared enough to actually do it. And if you take it that way, and if you take those notes and apply them and actually get them somewhere, that's going to be the best way for you to get into anything. That is like, I, that's like, yes. <laughs> Soft skills for the win. Right? <laughs> Soft skills. And, and it's, yeah, like, and the sad thing is, is the animation industry itself has no soft skills. Like we are so bad at everything. But, you know, that's the thing is like you as if you're into animation, if you're into gaming and the field, then then you have the same skills they have. Like, you know, all of the nerd speak, you know, all of the words like you don't even need the words. You just need that enthusiasm for the words and then the rest will follow, you know. So so go with that, I would say for sure. Well, we're we're uh, uh, over time, and I, I know a lot of people had to drop off for classes oh, and dear. stuff. But, yes, um, Atia, I just wanted to thank you so much again for speaking with all of us, and and that thank was awesome. Thank you so much. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> what were you gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say like, uh, I, yeah, I know I like fuddled in between because I was like, I don't know if I should be going faster or not, but I was like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I just had a lot to cover. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was perfect. And um, I, I shared your website in the chat. So um, y'all can um, cyber stalker. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah. I will be getting around to putting up more stuff pretty soon. I'm doing some like interesting things. Hopefully I'll get like trying to like figure out how to do a like just never mind. It's my next phase in production. So it's just one of those things where, uh, yeah, I get slow about updating my website. Cool. <laughs> Well, thanks again. And um, uh, students, hopefully we'll see some of you guys on April 9th for the uh, diversity and gaming discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me as well.